Okay. Hi, everyone on Facebook Live. Welcome. Um, we're here at City Gate, and um, <coughs> I have probably just one announcement. Um, and I have a flyer. I posted it on the men and women's main point ministries, but this is for everybody here, too. Um, on Saturday, March 2nd, we'll be having the third anniversary of Main Point uh, Ministries, and everyone's invited. Uh, just bring a dish to share. So the doors open at 4.30. We'll eat at 5.30. There'll be worship, um, testimonies, um, ministry updates, all that kind of stuff. So everybody's welcome to come for that. And I don't think I missed anything on there. If you have questions about that, um, you can see me or Floyd. It's going to be at Woodcrest Retreat. Um, so uh, you don't have to RSVP or anything. Just bring some food to share. Um, so that's that announcement. So I'm going to call up our speaker, which is Trisha Schlegel. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming. This is the first time we've met each other, but um, she goes to Ephrata Church of the Brethren and is active there, and she saw that we were looking for people to come and share their testimony, and um, she signed up, so we're thankful for her doing that. Yeah, thanks for coming. So I'm just going to offer a prayer for you, and then um, it's all yours. All right, sounds good. Thank okay. You. Well, Father God, thank you for Trisha and her willingness to come and share um, part of her story with us tonight. And I just pray that um, you'll speak through her for um, what we need to hear tonight. And we just pray for your will to be done. And um, just give us open hearts and open hear ears to hear what you're saying through her. So we just thank you for her life. We thank you. Um, for her relationship with you um, because I believe she has a firm foundation of faith. Um, so we just ask you to work through her and in her as we listen tonight and um, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. I'm going to cut some right yeah. All right. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. Um, so I'm really excited to be here tonight. I've been watching online for the past couple weeks, and I'm always amazed at the way God uh, connects our stories into kind of this beautiful tapestry that he is kind of making. Um, and we only get to see kind of a little glimpse of his work, but we are so very blessed to just be part of it. So I've given my testimony um, at a number of churches, a number of colleges, and at Lancaster County Prison. Um, and I'm always amazed each and every time that I've given my testimony how God has just moved in the midst. Um, he is just so uh, very, very faithful. So my testimony is a little bit heavy. Um, it's heavy for me. It's heavy for me to give it to you. It's also heavy for you to hear it. So if at any point you need to step out and take a minute, that's okay. Uh, feel free to do that. Uh, my testimony spans about 40 years, so it's taken me a lot of years to understand who God is in the midst of my life, and I'm still learning. I still feel like I have a lot to learn. Um, I prayed over what part of my short story to share with you, and I really wanted it to connect to um, God's story, and I really believe this is what he wanted me to share with you. So here we go. I believe that there's somebody here tonight that really needs to hear this truth, and I pray that... Um, my story blesses you and maybe allows you to even see a greater depth of who God is. So I was, born, I was telling some of you guys earlier, I was born and raised in Ephrata, um, raised Catholic. I actually attended our, Me our Mother Perpetual Health uh, up until the sixth grade. I went to school there. Um, and I, after that, went to Ephrata Middle School, which is now what, intermediate and I forget what it is now. Or maybe it was, it was Ephrata Junior High. That's what it was when I attended there. Um, I came from a family who loved me. I came from good parents. Uh, we didn't have a lot. I had five siblings, but we always had food on the table and a roof over our heads. And I was the third daughter, so I got the lovely hand-me-downs from my other two much older sisters. My father at one point worked three jobs to be able to support us, um, all of us, and trying to, to raise us. 
And I was just telling you guys, it's so funny that you asked me about where I lived, because I lived on West Main Street. We rented a house there, and then when I was about 10 years old, we moved to South State Street. So really born and raised here my whole life. Um, I grew up in a really safe world. I didn't have any reason to not feel safe. I didn't feel safe in my home. I felt safe at my school. And I really didn't have any reason to think that anything bad would ever happen to me. And I really, in going to OMPH, I really learned that God is my father. It was very much a father-child relationship and that God would always protect me. And uh, the sin of this world kind of attacked my small little world in October of 1983. Um, I was 14 at the time, and I was sexually assaulted um, by a boy that I really liked. Um, the attack was physically brutal, and that night just absolutely shook me to my core. Uh, fast forward 40 years, and I have yet to describe the words and find the words to describe to you kind of the shame that I felt related to all of that. Um, it was like somebody threw a blanket over my head and I told nobody what happened to me because I was just so ashamed of what happened to me for many, many years. Um, and the boy told me a lot of things um, during the assault. He told me that I was ruined. He told me that no decent man would ever want me. Um, and he told me that it was my fault because I made, made him mad. And I believe that. I really, really believe that. Um, over the next few years, up until I met my husband, I made a lot of really bad decisions. And a lot of, I believed a lot of those lies. I lost all my friends in school uh, because I just couldn't stand to be around them. They were just a constant reminder of kind of what I was not anymore. Um, and so it was really difficult to be around them, and I became involved with a much older group of men. Um, in my teenage, mid-teenage years, uh, they were in their mid-20s. And I was just incredibly vulnerable, so um, they had a lot of advantage taken in as well. So uh, in order to combat that, I kind of built this wall around my heart. And I felt like it was a way I was trying to protect myself. And I learned that there was a cost to everything. And that people very, very rarely do things for someone nice without expecting something in return. <coughs> I have to tell you, when my friend Jen showed up tonight, I was just so touched. Because it's very difficult for someone like me to know that people take time when I invite them to my space. So I just really appreciate it. Um, so after college, I did get a really decent guy, my husband, who we've been married 34 years. His name is Ron, and we had four children. Um, I became a nurse, and I lived about 20 years kind of being afraid um, in a lot of darkness. I was so afraid that somebody was going to find out who I really was that I was that girl. And if you would have known me in that time of my life, uh, you would have not known about my daily struggles. I became really good at hiding my true emotions, and I could really fool anyone into believing that I was totally A-OK. -okay. I even convinced myself of that for quite a long time. Um, but this is what happens with trauma, and when you go through something like that, in your life, and that's you have one of those traumatic events, it kind of comes out sideways. Um, it comes out in relationships, and for me, it came out with kind of this lack of trust. I just couldn't trust people, and I, even my husband. Um, it comes out with sleep problems and depression and an overwhelming sense that there was something very, very wrong with me. I felt like I was infected with evil, um, and that was really hard. My body remembers what happens to me because sometimes <coughs> I don't have a linear kind of memory, like a normal memory. It's kind of in pieces. Um, so those are just some things that I still deal with to this day. So in 2002, I gave birth to my fourth child, a little girl. Um, this was 19 years after the assault, and my life was just a mess. Um, I started to see a therapist, because that's what you do, right? You go to therapy when you're having a hard time. 
And so from 2002 till 2005, they were really, really difficult years for me. I started to go through uh, kind of ex ex like an exposure therapy where um, you kind of remember what you can remember and they try to connect that with what the feelings would be. Because a lot of times with trauma, you don't really have to know what your feelings are. Um, and I reflected over my journals and there was just an incredible amount of pain that I was having in my life during that time. And no one, again, still knew how much I was suffering. Um, and I tried to even convince myself uh, that I was, what I was telling my therapist was true. Um, in my head, I did enough research to know that trauma, what happens with that, why I was thinking about I needed to con have control in my life, why I felt powerlessness, I fought daily with kind of intrusive images, and I was on antidepressants, I was on medicine for sleep, and with all of that, I did obtain some level of peace. I really did. Um, but you know what? I'm convinced to this day that if there was a way to heal myself, I would have done it. <laughs> I would have figured it out. Um, I couldn't name it at the time, but I had kind of this hole in my life that I just couldn't, couldn't fill. And I kept asking myself, you know, with all the work I did and for three years of this therapy that I was going through once or twice a week, why wasn't that enough? I mean, I read all the books about what you needed to do. I read everything. It just wasn't enough. I still had, I was still hurting so much all the time. I stepped away from church at this time. And after those three years, my therapist, as God does, he left his practice, which left me Wow, what am I going to do now? It turned out to be a huge blessing because God said at that point, you know what? You need to come back to me. Like, I need you back. And he never stopped pursuing me, which was really amazing, which brought me to my current church where I go to. Um, desperation drove me back to the church, and it brought me to my current church, to the back pew with four kids and a very broken but well put together me. It was in the room that I learned about grace and love and about people that really wanted nothing from me, which was really an odd thing for me to even understand. I heard about Jesus, and I heard about why there's pain and suffering in the world, and for the first time, I saw this trauma in my life as something bigger than me and something that can have purpose. And so um, really excited of thinking and working through that, that God can redeem it all. A church member uh, during one of those first weeks was the first one to pray for me. And um, I have no idea what she said to this day, but I can tell you how I felt. And for the first time in my life, I had felt seen. And that was so important to me to actually feel seen. So I started to read the Bible and I started to understand who God is. And I read this passage and it's one that has stayed with me on my worst days and even 40 years later, I still uh, quite often uh, read this. And I think it's a reminder to myself about who God is and what lengths he will go to protect us. And the scriptures from Psalm 18, 1 through 6, and 16 through 19, it's from the Song of David. And he sang that after the Lord uh, saved him from his enemies. And it reads, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The, death, the cords of death entangled me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temples he heard my cry. My cry came before him into his ears. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. And I think the reason why this was so powerful for me was because there was a point um, during the assault itself where I really was in a lot of pain, and I prayed. 
and I prayed a couple different things, but the one thing I clearly remember was I prayed something along the lines of, God, please just take me and make him stop. And I really was praying that God would take me to heaven with him, right? I wanted out of that situation. Um, and God pulled me out of that space that I was in, and he set me somewhere, I don't know how he did it, but he did, uh, where it was dark and it was quiet. And for years, I felt nothing. I don't, I don't have any feeling related to that. And for years, because I felt nothing, I thought that meant that I was nothing. Um, when I returned to, the, to my body, so to speak, the assault was over, and by the grace of God, I stood up and I was able to walk away. But this is where I was stuck. Uh, for many years, I believed that you know, that feeling of nothingness meant that I was nothing, that I was nothing, and that God let this happen to me because he didn't love me. But um, what I've come to know over time is that I firmly believe that when he pulled me out of that space, he stepped into that space for me. Mm -hmm. And it took me 24 years to get that truth. 24 years is a long time. Um, I've come to know that he held me in this quiet, dark space because he knew my body and my mind couldn't handle and take any more, so he protected me. In the moment that I believed I was nothing was precisely the moment that I was actually everything to him. Just as he took my place on the cross, I truly to this day believe that he came down and took my place there for me. He heard my cries. He came down from heaven. He pulled me out of those deep waters. He rescued me all because he delighted in me. The space where I was was dark and quiet like a womb. Now that's the best place I can, that's the best way I can explain it. In that place, I was the most protected. He protected my spirit. He protected the part of me that the rapist could never touch. And for years that I thought I was nothing to my father, but in those moments, I was everything. Um, I was somehow suspended, protected, away from the community. God never abandoned me, ever. When I came back to my physical body, the pain was there, but tolerable. The assault was over, and I did tell you it was 24 years to get to that point. Um, and to believe in God's compassion for me and his holy love for me. For me, a broken, fractured girl and a promiscuous, self-serving young woman, to a healed sinner uh, saved by his grace with nothing to prove. So God has healed me, and my healing looks different than a lot of other people's healing looks. I have post-traumatic stress disorder, which means I still struggle. I struggle with intrusive thoughts. I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with sleep problems, with nightmares. I struggle sometimes with being present in the moment, which is really hard when you had children growing up. Um, and it's easy for me to get caught in my head to think that because I have these issues, that God didn't heal me. No, God really didn't heal you. But that's a lie from the enemy, absolutely a lie. Um, God has shown me, though, that I shouldn't settle. He's like, you know what? There's, <coughs> there's so much more to healing than just not having negative things happen in your life, not having negative thoughts. He says to me, there's a greater healing that I want you to understand, and I want you to understand that no matter what is happening in your life, I am with you and I am for you, no matter what. And so, oh, it just gives me chills every time I say it. In those situations, I am not alone ever. And so that, do I wake up at 2 a.m. with nightmares? Sure. Um, am I able to immediately turn my head and my body off? No. But I'll tell you what, God's right there. I hear, I know him. I can hear him. I can feel him. He's right there. God is with me and for me. Um, that means when my body is reacting to this unidentified source of fear, God is with me, that I shouldn't settle for no nightmares when the creator of the universe is here with me. It has everything to do with his great love for me and for us, rather than my need for relief in that immediate moment. He will take all those things uh, away in the future. Oh, will he take all those things away in the future? Maybe. But if he doesn't, they serve as a great reminder for where Jesus is in the midst of trials and the depths which he will go to reach his children, mm -hmm. to reach me and to reach you. I have a lot of favorite scriptures, uh, but one that gives me great peace is Romans 8, 37 to 39. 
And it says, For I am convinced that neither not death nor life, nor angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love that is in God, that is the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an incredible promise that is. When you hear my story, it's not a testimony about being free from the sins of another person or another human being uh, with no more pain, but rather it's about Jesus who saw my pain and took my place. It's about a God who has pursued me even when I was rejecting him. It's about forgiveness and remembering God's promises to us. And finally, my story is one of God's great love for me and that nothing will come between him and me ever. I have great peace and joy in my life now because the God of the universe who never changes, who is all powerful, all knowing, always present, holy, full of wisdom, goodness, just, full of grace, mercy, faithfulness, is with me and he's with you. I'm valuable, I'm created to do good, I'm alive in Christ, I am no longer condemned, I am healed. No worries. I am healed and redeemed. Uh, some people try to be helpful, and they tell me that that happened such a long time ago that I just should forget it. And boy, if I could, maybe I would. But I have physical pain every day uh, to the injuries that were I sustained during the assault. Actually, I just had a surgery this past December. Uh, so I'm reminded of what happens to me physically to my body every day. But the difference is now is that he's healed me. He's healed me so much, it's, uh, it's really unbelievable. So when I think about who I am because of Jesus, I know that I am chosen, I am treasured because of Jesus. I am loved, I am free, I am forgiven. Um, I'm a child of God, adopted, a new person, and that all those things God says about me are true. So if you're here tonight and you're a believer too, all those things he says about you are the same things he says about me. You are loved, never forgotten, and nothing will ever separate you from his love. So thank you for being in this space tonight, in this sacred space, and for listening to my story. It's not always the easy one to hear, so I hope that it has blessed you and gave you some encouragement. Thank you. Here for a few minutes. Sure. And um, mm-hmm. anybody has any comments, questions, encouragement? I'm an open book. You can ask me whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have to be back by eight. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. Thanks. Sometime you'll have to ask if you can just stay longer. Oh, I know. Because <laughs> <laughs> we would love Bye. to have you. Yeah. See ya. Bye. Any questions, comments? Encouragement, Patricia. It's he- it's, yeah. a he- it's heavy. It's, you know, it is a lot to process, but we are so good at sharing it. I mean, I would. Yeah, that's tough. I love how like you don't don't just focus on like God healing you, but you focus on like the presence of Jesus. Mm-hmm. That no matter like. You believe for healing, you believe like for his best, but even in the process, it's like that it's important that he is working through it and he's speaking to you through it. Yeah, I appreciate that because for a long time, I would, you know, I'd have a nightmare or something would happen and I'd think, oh, you know, maybe, maybe he really isn't doing as much work with me as I think he is. And that was a really, that was a big, (laughs) that was a big breakthrough uh, when he showed me that. Yeah, and you're so positive about it. That's what I got from it. Even though you still suffer some effects, you like kind of like what you said. Like you still see Jesus is there. Yeah. You know, no matter what. And I too would question if I was healed or not. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's the doubts that we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. The doubts that our enemy tries to sow in our in our minds. So. That's amazing. Um, I don't know. I jotted down a lot. <laughs> I jotted down a lot of things. Anybody else have anything? Um, it's very, very like encouraging and inspiring that 
you you know who you are in Christ and you are healed. Thank you. It's taken me a long time to believe that. Because sometimes you can say it in your head, but you don't know it in your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, It took me a long, long time. And I'm still, there's still days, I think, that I struggle with that a little bit. But um, I'm just so incredibly thankful to be on this side with him. Yeah, and how important is it to remember that he's for us? Right. You know, because when things happen, we can think he's not, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that was a big one for me for a long time. You know, I didn't feel like he was for me. Mm-hmm. And with again with you, one of my things was I didn't feel seen. Yes. For different reasons, mm-hmm. but that that is tough. Yeah. Um, and we act out or do things or have behaviors because we feel like we're not seen right. or heard. Right. Um, so that's that is a big one. Um, and. You said something about, I jotted down, but I don't know if I got it as you said it, but relief in the moment, like you don't really look for that. Yeah, I don't look for that um, because God has really shown me that that's kind of the lesser thing that he wants to give mm-hmm. me is not just relief in the moment. Right, that is he so wa- important. He mm-hmm. wants me to have the presence of him with Yeah. So that's been a really... It's just so amazing that he's actually wanting to be part of my life, is my part of my life, is just my God. He's my man. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. it's mind-blowing, really. But that whole relief in the moment, I think, in our culture, we're a microwave society. Mm -hmm. You know, we want everything fixed right now. We want everything done right now. And uh, I think that's really important. to think about that. No, we don't need immediate relief because he's trying to teach us something through that waiting. Like his timing is perfect. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and and if you have struggled with something in the in your past like like Trisha has, you know, pray for revelation. Pray for God to reveal why you're doing what you're doing, you know, that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because he will show you. I mean, I've shared some of my story before, how he showed me um, what part of my struggle was. Um, but he will. In time, if you ask, he will reveal what are the underlying things um, that maybe you've had traumas that you don't even realize. Because, like you said, God took you out of that at the moment mm-hmm. that that was happening. Right. And he does that. That's how our brains are made. That's how we're wired because he knows that we can't handle everything at one time. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it's a trauma is a tough, a tough thing. And there's different kinds of trauma. Yours was physical, emotional, spiritual, everything, you know, um, a lot of people don't have all of those all in one thing, but there's traumatic events that happen that maybe we don't, we haven't identified. Right. So um, find someone you trust and talk through some things um, like that. And I love when you said at that moment when you were removed, he took your place. Yeah. That brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. Seriously. And it took 24 years. Wow. 24 years to understand mm-hmm. that about God. But that, he revealed that to you. He did. Yeah. Absolutely. That was an important piece of your puzzle. It was huge mm-hmm. because... At that point, I was, you know, thinking, why, why did God lead me there? I must have been nothing. I wasn't anything. I didn't mean anything to Him. Why did He let that happen to begin with? Just a lot of those kind of questions, uh, which I had to, to work through. And He was kind enough. He's a gentleman, right? Mm-hmm. So right. He waits for us to be ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and how you, you know, mentioned He. T- he took our place on the cross. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. sometimes, you know, we kind of don't forget about that. But I think you saying it in the context of he took your place while that event was happening mm-hmm. to you, and then say, yes, he took my place on the cross. I don't know. It just impacted me. Did anybody else mm-hmm. feel yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like wow. Um, so wow, that was yeah. You you had some really good 
revelations for us too. So thank you so much Absolutely. for being vulnerable and, and sharing your story. Nobody's going to ask about forgiveness. It's usually a question. <laughs> I was yeah. just getting ready. To <laughs> um, yeah, how did you? Yeah. Um, so most days I would say that I forgive. Um, most days I, I make a conscious effort to say, um, you know, I forgive this, this boy. I still see him on occasion, which puts me in a huge oh, tailspin. Wow. Um, he was in jail for a little bit. He's back now. Um, it's, it's really difficult those times. So most days I remember what God has done for me yeah. uh, and his forgiveness for me. And it's very easy for me to, to say, okay, I forgive, I can forgive him. Yeah. But there are times, there are days that I struggle. Um, I really, really struggle. The days that physically I'm really hurting, uh, it's really difficult. And what I've, what I've, and I don't know if this is biblical, so, <laughs> um, so do you remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Yeah. So I believe that those days that I really struggle, I say, Father, forgive them because I can't do it today. And so that's, that's what has to happen on those days. And I've learned not to be guilty about that because I used to feel so guilty. Um, I don't feel guilty anymore. There's just it's just beyond me, mm-hmm. and so there. That's why you know that's why I have God and um, yeah. You so turn it over to Him. I try to. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the best thing to do. Yeah, it really is. I can I can relate to a lot of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So, um, forgiving was is definitely hard, but I really prayed hard for the Lord to give me the spirit of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And during my assaults that happened to me in my life, mm-hmm. at the time, I was like, Father, forgive them. Like, even though I wasn't fully serving the Lord at the time, it was just something that I wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I didn't hate. Right. Because hate turns into bitterness, right. and it can get you in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that you say that because I, had, I, I wrote a book. At one point in my life, I'm going to publish it when I get braver. I'm not okay. quite brave enough yet, but I wrote that, um, I was trying to work through some things, and I used to say long, long time ago that I have a God-given right to hate him. Mm-hmm. I used to feel that, but you know what? God doesn't have anything to do with hate, right. so what I was feeling towards him was not from God, no. and it took me time to work through that, yeah. um, because I have a God-given right to love, mm-hmm. but not hate. That's not, not hate. That is not from God. Because the devil is legalistic. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. <laughs> have the right. Mm-hmm. You were wrong. Like, <laughs> this is the legal system. There you go. Yeah. And like I said earlier tonight, like, spiritual things seem to always be a process. Mm-hmm. So forgiveness is definitely a process. Yeah. And the people who say, oh, forgive and forget, that's not biblical for one thing it's not in the bible and um you know just because we forgive somebody the forgiveness part is for us Mm -hmm. you know um so we don't wallow in bitterness and hate and that kind of thing um but you know there are things that you're never going to be able to forget like this and i and i don't think god expects us to forget i don't think so either and he is using those things to mature you spiritually. So in that way, he uses what people meant for evil against us, and he uses it for good. Amen. So everything can be redeemed, because that's who he is. He's the redeemer. And Oh, there we go. Oh, I love that. I might have to look at that. <laughs> My mother's not alive anymore. I can get a tattoo if I want to. <laughs> now, she might yeah, roll in her grave, but I can get one. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Like, a lot of spiritual things are a process. Forgiveness is a process. And what, what else were we talking about earlier? I just lost that whole thing. Um, but, yeah. It's a process, and usually it's to mature us. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And God, and He uses what we've been through 